service to generations of loyal customers. We believe in excellence in all we do, and that is why we're pleased to bring you this special presentation without commercial interruption. And now, coming home, the John Catch story. You know, out of all the knuckleheads on this team, how could it be John Catch? You know, because he's, he's, you know, as straight as as a kid could be and hard work, he never really got into trouble. And, you know, your heart just pours out for him. It's really weird because the day before, I was in my car, like, listening to um, a song on the radio, and I was just thinking, if anything ever happened to him, I don't know what I would do. And it was really weird that I was thinking that the day before it happened. And then all of a sudden, one day, your life turns around, and you send him off to college and you worry about drinking and driving and priorities and all of this and that's not what took place it was something out of nowhere that ate him up that changed our lives forever for most of us the year 2000 was just another year we will remember it for the millennium celebrations the strong economy or the presidential recount the Catch family will remember it as Ground Zero, the year they fought an enemy they couldn't see, summoned courage they didn't know they had, and leaned on faith they never imagined they'd need. They will remember the year for its nightmares, its heartaches, and its hope. This is their story. I mean, I can't imagine March 11th coming around next year, or the year after, the year after, you know, and not thinking, God, how that changed our lives. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. It began Friday, March 10th, a chilly late winter day at Salve Regina University in Newport, Rhode Island. For students at the private Catholic school, it marked the middle of the semester and the countdown to spring break. It was a typical start to the weekend. Most students were getting ready for Friday night. It should have been the kind of night being young is all about, full of laughter and promise. A fun, forgettable college night. For 19-year-old John Catch and the people who love him, that Friday would become a demarcation line in their lives forever separating all that had come before from what happened after. It was so weird how it happened so quick. In a matter of like 15 minutes, he got really sick. John was one of the few students who did not go out that evening. He had decided to stay in his dorm room at Miley Hall because he wasn't feeling well. His girlfriend, Kristen Moore, changed her plans at the last minute to stay with him. Her decision would change everything. Around 12 o'clock, I had to go out and move my car, and he was fine. He just was saying he had a stomachache, and 15 minutes later, I came back, and he was sick. He was shaking. Uh, he had a temperature of about 103, um, and he was really weak, and then he started to get sick. And then about six hours later, he was still getting sick. It was about 6 o'clock in the morning, and I was like, John, I'm taking you to the hospital. I thought he was just dehydrated. Because every time I'd give him water or anything like that, he'd just um, throw, throw it up. John didn't want to go to the hospital, insisting he just had the flu. But Kristen, believing it was something more, took him anyway. By the time they reached the emergency room in Newport, John was so weak he could barely talk. Dr. James Gleason was on duty. After about an hour and a half, two hours, you know, it was obvious he wasn't going home. He was going to need to be admitted. Um, I didn't know really what was causing his illness, but I was afraid that it may have been some sort of bacterial illness that could be pretty serious. So I decided I was going to put him on a pretty broad spectrum antibiotic at that point. From the waiting room, Kristen called John's parents, Mike and Paige Catch, at their home in Carmel, New York. Paige, in turn, called the hospital to talk to a nurse. 
the nurse said, you know, he was very dehydrated, but we're going to hydrate him, and he should be okay, and we'll probably end up, you know, releasing him and sending him home in the afternoon. So I said, okay, you know, that's fine. You know, no biggie. Went about my business. And they let me in to see him, and he was fine. He seemed better because he was, he was less weak and was just talking a little bit more. Maybe an hour, an hour and a half later, I get another phone call, and it's from the nurse, and she said, um, Dr. Gleason would like to speak with you. And I was like, okay. So he gets on the phone, he said, you know, Mrs. Ketch, this is Dr. Gleason. He said, you know, I think I may keep John overnight in ICU. He said, I, I just have a funny feeling that I may be missing something here. We're giving him the antibiotics to cover almost any infection, but we're still not sure what we're dealing with. It's, it's probably okay to come tomorrow. So I was reassuring her at that point that everything's okay. But John was not okay. Almost immediately, he began to deteriorate. When I was uh, looking at his back, I started noticing tiny, small, like pinpoint uh, marks, kind of purplish in color. There were a few of them on his lower back. And what was really uh, difficult to watch was that within the next hour or two, the rash just spread. It went from tiny little marks to larger marks throughout his trunk and to his face. Even the whites of his eyes started to hemorrhage. In front of my eyes, it was described as watching a house burn down or a wildfire, and you're throwing water on it, and nothing can be done to stop it. I was on the phone with my girlfriend. I get a call waiting. It's Dr. Gleason. This is Ketch. We're transporting John from Newport Hospital to Rhode Island Hospital. You have got to get up here as soon as you can. And I was like, what are, you, what are you talking about? And he said, your son is a very, very sick boy. Now, I'm saying to him, I'm sure he's on antibiotics, he's going to be okay, and I'm waiting for him to say, of course, Miss Ketch, we got him on antibiotics, he's going to be fine. He never said that, and I couldn't figure out why he wouldn't say to me, he's going to be okay. And every time I pulled, tried to pull that out, like, okay, but he's going to be okay, right? He kept saying, he's a very, very sick boy, please get here as soon as you can. That was a, one of the most toughest phone calls I ever had to make. Uh, I could hear it in her voice. I'm sure she could hear it in mine. And I remember um, putting the phone down and just falling to the ground saying, oh my God, please. And I was by myself, so I was scared. I was like, God, please, what? What could this be? What are they talking about? As Mike and Paige raced to New England, John's ambulance sped to Rhode Island Hospital. The unofficial diagnosis, meningococcemia, a rare strain of viral meningitis, fast-moving and potentially fatal. The virus was already in John's bloodstream, attacking his organs. His chances of surviving the night were less than 20%. Two weeks earlier, John was fighting for a win on the hard court for the Salve Regina basketball team. At 6'4", 210 pounds, John was a natural athlete. He thrived on competition and beating the odds. His teammates and coach, Michael Plansky, say that was most evident in the final moments against Bridgewater State. Come on, Nelson, My memory would be the Bridgewater State game. We were uh, tied or we were down one, and uh, I drove the lane and dished it to John. And we're all waiting, like, shoot the thing, shoot the thing. <laughs> I thought time was going to run out, and he scored. And we won the game. And that just sticks in my mind all the time. But when the cheering was over, it wasn't the athlete in John or his all-American good looks that drew people to him. It was his gentle spirit, the kind of goodness we work hard to teach our children, the kind of caring we always hope we showed others. John had that, along with an easy smile and a devilish sense of humor. It made it easy for him to make friends and to earn the nickname Johnny Appleseed. He is kind, warm, sensitive, but a typical 19-year-old kid. Um, but he's never really had a bad word about anybody. He doesn't uh, talk about things that other people have done. He's just, that's just not his way. You know, he's very, he's kind. Mature? You know? 
He's very mature. mature. He's very, very mature. Yeah. His priorities are set. He's always had his priorities set. You know, like kids at school would say, why John? He's the only one that does his homework. He's the only one that goes to class. You know, he never missed any classes. He almost did not play for us, because after the first week of practice, he came into my office, and he had like one seat, and the rest were B's and A's. And he just said, I can't play, this is unacceptable. And I said, I said, what's that? You're doing okay, it's first semester. I mean, it was like the first couple months. And he just said, no, he said, I can do better than that. He said, if basketball is going to take me away from that, then I'm going to have to give up basketball. But that's how important the academic side of it was to him. And that's kind of how he took things. John grew up in a small, loving family, the oldest of two boys. Always close to his younger brother, Michael, the bond grew as the boys did. He was a star on his varsity team, and I'd be playing eighth grade on my church team, and he would come home from his varsity game, and he, would, and he wouldn't even say anything about himself, but he'd ask me how I did. And <laughs> uh, varsity's a little bit more important than what I was playing back then. But he still, he always cared more about me. And just because I guess he felt that, I mean, he did teach me everything. And just like him, do that. Mike and Paige were very involved in their son's lives, attending school events, coaching teams, or just having fun. They were an average dual income American family. Paige is a clerk for the local building inspector, Mike is a plant manager. They had lived most of John's life in the same house in Carmel, New York, a small town at the base of the Hudson Valley. It was a life complicated only by day-to-day -day problems, problems that became insignificant as they approached Rhode Island Hospital. You look back and you think how you pulled in, thinking that it, never thinking that it would have been this case scenario. <laughs> John was taken straight to the critical care unit where the diagnosis was official, meningococcemia, an exceptionally rare and vicious strain of viral meningitis that spreads through the body in hours. Most people do not survive the first day. Dr. Nick Ward was the first to treat John. He was up here by about 3 o'clock in the afternoon and uh, um, was you know, awake and talking to us and everything, starting to feel really bad at that point. But by about seven o'clock that night was, you know, utterly horrible. By midnight that night, he was really, you know, at death's door. They brought in a fellow from disease control and uh, infectious disease, and uh, kept asking, "Has your son been out of the uh, out of the country? Has he been to South America? Uh, is, uh, has he been to the Far East? Uh, has he been to Africa? He hasn't been out of New England." Meningococcemia is spread by saliva, so John could have gotten it anywhere. It happens most where people are in close quarters, such as military barracks or college dorms. The symptoms are initially like the flu, so many people put off going to the hospital as John wanted to. By the time they get help, it is often too late. The clotting system in his body was completely out of whack. He was Your body in that situation forms blood clots in places where it shouldn't, and it doesn't clot when it should. And uh, the net result of that is that it, it can clog up and shut down organs. And it can also, um, if you have any uh, breaks in your skin or blood vessels anywhere, you bleed uncontrollably from them. And so um, when you combine that situation with septic shock, it's just a, it's a horrible one-two punch. By midnight, John was delirious and in pain. His organs had begun to shut down, first his kidneys, then his lungs. Doctors quickly put him into a drug-induced coma, literally paralyzing his body so the machines could do the work for his organs. It was necessary to do to keep him alive, but chances were he would not survive. An ICU nurse was sent to tell Mike and Paige. So it was her job, basically, to come out here and explain to us exactly what was going on and more or less prepare us for his death. That was her job which we didn't understand that's what she was doing. But they did ask us, are you religious? I said, uh, are, are, you, are you telling me we have to get a priest in here? And they said, yeah, I think so. And then that was basically the hardest thing that, that, 
that you can imagine a parent would have to do. And we say, do you mean to tell us that our son is going to die? And they said, he very well may. John was given last rites, and his parents waited. They knew each minute their son lived was a 60-second victory. I took his watch, been wearing it since, and uh, he was basically living hour to hour. Uh, and, uh, you know, you'd, 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 you'd look at their watch, and, it, you know, from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock in the morning, you're, you know, you're looking and you say, yeah, he made it another hour. 45 minutes later, you're looking at it and you say, 15 more minutes and he made it to another hour. It was, uh, it was almost over 50 hours and uh, everything just got a little blurry after that. Against all odds, John made it through the first 48 hours, but the doctors cautioned against optimism. The disease was gone from his body, but his organs could still fail. He could lose limbs, sight, hearing, or have significant brain damage. They said it was going to be a rocky, rocky road. Did you have any idea what rocky, rocky road meant? No. No. Rocky, bumpy road? No. no. They were like, take care of yourself, you're in for a really long haul. Mike and Paige prepared for battle. They set up camp in the hospital where they would spend the next two months praying. try to, to get through up and down and nobody saying he's not going to die for so long. It was more than you could almost bear. Three weeks passed and John still lay in ICU in a drug-induced coma. His kidneys had shut down, forcing him onto dialysis. One lung had collapsed, requiring a chest tube. Mike and Paige took over a section of the waiting room, setting up a shrine of sorts to their son. Well, for two and a half weeks, we slept, weeks. In these chairs. And we slept in these chairs. And we had pictures and, and mass cards, so many things that people had sent, and a beautiful worry box with three little angels in it. We would set it up every day against the window. It became a gathering place, a corner crowded with loved ones and memories. Oh, you're so precious. Oh, it's your baby. There were many days I looked at them, just couldn't imagine what it would be like to have your son on the brink of death day after day after day for you know for weeks and wake up every single day and not know whether he's going to make you know be alive one more day i remember going in and i whispered to him um, when he was on the respirator if you can't do this if you want to go mommy will understand and don't you stay for me if you can't do this you go. If you want to stay and fight, we will fight this together. Either way, Mommy will understand. On the campus of Salve Regina, news of John's illness hit especially hard. I remember the first mass they had, it was rough, you know. And uh, it was real hot in there, I remember that. And we were just all in there. And, we were all a mess and we came out and most of us were in tears. I know I was. I, I just couldn't believe it. Stunned by the severity of John's illness, students lined up at campus health services for a meningitis vaccine. John's girlfriend, Kristen, and the basketball team were told to come first. I went to dinner and like the cafeteria was packed and I heard people whispering stuff about like the basketball team. So I got real nervous and I called health services and they told me that there was like kind of an emergency on campus. It was like uncertainty, because you really didn't know what was going on, you didn't know what was going to happen. I was more in a state of shock than a state of fear, because I didn't know about the disease, I didn't know what it did. In Carmel, New York, the tragedy brought the community together. Daily vigils began at the Catches Small Catholic Church and at the local high school. Vice Principal Robert Bergen. I think initially it was shock, prayers, and please God let John live. The town pulled together. A fundraising campaign was born. The motto, Carmel for Catch. Donation containers were placed on store counters. The local police and teachers union sent cards and money. One group of school children donated $3,000. There were people who said to me, Paige, we've lived in this district for 20 years and we've never seen people come together like this. At the hospital, an even more remarkable turn of events. Word of John's illness had touched complete strangers. 
After reading articles about John, they began to send hundreds of cards and letters, some even coming to the waiting room. Page recalls one such man. Do you Page catch him? I said yes, and he said, you know, I read your article, and my heart goes out to you, and I, I know this isn't much, but I want to give you a little something. It was a little, little envelope. And he said, you know, my prayers are with you, and blah, blah. I don't even think I got his name, and I hugged him, and I said, you don't have to do this. And he said, no, it's the least I could do. Maybe it'll help. And he walked away, and I hugged him, and I kissed him, and I thanked him, and we opened up. This is $100 in this envelope. He kind of got adopted. Um, and I think it was because they found out how sick he was. You know, he was referred to as the kid, you know, in the ICU. And, uh, and people would leave the floor, get moved down to a different floor, and they would still come up and see how John was doing. And these are people, you know, that Paige and Mike had never met before. There was Fatima, the Portuguese cleaning woman who brought daily mass cards and handwritten letters to John. And Dan, the firefighter who had spent months in the same ICU. He came to the hospital as soon as he read about John and returned every morning with coffee and donuts. Strange thing. It's like uh, their family. It's like I've known them forever. So I can't explain it. I think it's a, some higher power, definitely some higher power. Even the ICU nurses began to take a personal interest in John. Some began to come in on their days off to check his progress. I think it's part of it is because the love that Paige and Mike and that whole family has for him, they just kind of attracted everybody to him. And, and people wanted a piece of that. By the end of April, John's kidneys and lung had recovered. Mike and Paige were still waiting for him to come out of his coma. They held fast to their hope and looked to the river below for strength. It's just such a familiar sight. We see it so often. Further down, there's three towers, and they blink. And I remember looking at them, thinking that they would always, bl you know, they were always blinking. And they was always like my blinking lights of hope. That hope was put to music by Mike's brother, John. He wrote a song for his nephew with a title and lyrics that echoed the family's prayers. He's coming home. So he'll be coming home again. He'll be coming home again. He'll be coming home. He'll be coming home. After six weeks of darkness, John opened his eyes. His mother went in the room and he looked at her and she looked at him and she just simply said, I love you. And you could see in his, you know, he burst out into tears. And I think that meant so much to everyone because if even if the worst had happened from that point on, I think that's the very least she would have wanted to do is just one more time to say, you know, that she loves him. And, uh, you know, there, there wasn't a dry eye in the house after that, after that day. That he has survived the coma is a miracle, but John awakes to devastating news. He is an amputee. The blood clots caused by the meningitis left his limbs gangrenous. He has lost his right leg below the knee, the toes on his left foot, and all eight fingers. He could lose more. Dr. Mitchell Levy heads the critical care unit. Unfortunately, with this illness, especially because of the involvement of his limbs, the, the nightmare really just begins to find out how much he's going to lose, um, how well he'll heal, and then once he's healed, to begin the rehabilitation process. You've got this this morning. Just be a high potassium. Mm -hmm. I can give it to you in your arm or I can give it to you in your belly. John's body is wasted. What remains of his hands and left foot are bound and unusable. His voice damaged from the tracheotomy and disuse. It does not deter him from talking. Um, the last thing I remember was being in the ambulance, going down 95, or up, I'm not sure, and uh, being dropped off here at the hospital. And then I don't remember anything until I wake up, woke up. I thought it was just a regular meningitis. I didn't think it was anything um, big. And I was just going to get sick. And, you know, you know, maybe have the flu or whatever for a couple of days and get over it. But I wasn't that lucky. Incredibly, John's mind is intact and sharp. 
his spirit stronger than anything else he has. It was tough. I didn't know what had happened. Um, but they told me, and I still don't think I realized at first like it happened to me. But, uh, you know, now I, I'm set face with it. And, you know, I have to go on. I talked to him, made sure he was awake and oriented, and I said, are you okay with all of this? And he said, oh yeah, and my, I couldn't help myself. My reaction was, why? Why are you okay with this? And he said, I, I don't know, I just, I can deal with this. I'll be okay with this. Are you different from the person that you were before? I don't think so. I think this made me stronger. Show me what I can overtake, overcome, and uh, how, and it makes me see how, how people care so much that they'll do, uh, you know, they can do so much for you. I think it made me be stronger. But John's will is stronger than his body. One, two. As he talks, he begins to get sick from the medicine the nurse has given him. It is a small glimpse at his suffering. Unbelievable, man. I'm sorry. You're getting more on me than... Paige is overseeing the details of John's recovery. Her husband has had to return to work in New York after a two-month leave. Dr. Levy has become a pivotal figure in their lives. So, how are you doing? Yeah? So, people have been coming to visit a lot? Yeah? How's your mood? How are you doing? Yeah? You look okay. I don't think yeah. Too many visitors? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. How about the filming? Is it making you crazy that they come by? No. No? Okay. I <laughs> Yeah, you are, right. You're a jock, so you like the attention and the... Yeah, sure. I think at this point, we're going to try to push and feed you. I mean, it, we should be able to get some solid food in there as well. After reassuring John, Dr. Levy takes Paige into the hallway. They are concerned about John's ability to swallow. There's no obstacle physiologically why he can't start to swallow and eat now. I know that. I know that. But they should just, he should just encourage him to sip, and if he gets, so he gets, uh, he throws up every once in a while. But, but really, he should be eating hamburgers now. And I think if, oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that you're right. I think that this is somewhat just in it is really anxious, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the more we can get him to just push through this, he'll feel a lot better. How about if I just go right here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And this is just sugar and water. Sugar and water. This is the toughest phase. He's right now pretty helpless and weak. He's been lying on his back or in a chair for, I think it might be eight weeks now. He has another probable month of uh, cleanup surgeries before he gets transferred back to a rehab center. And he's going to have to learn to work with a prosthetic device on his uh, right leg. And he's going to have to learn how to reuse his hands all over again and uh, build up just muscle strength. And, and that's difficult for anybody. But you're talking about a 19-year-old kid who was uh, playing a starting player on a basketball team, Salvi Regina. So, he and I talk a lot about how frustrating this is for him, and he acknowledges that he's very frustrated. First, I want to get out of here, then um, get stronger, get my aesthetic aesthetics, and then uh, try to get back to school as fast as I can because you know college is it's, it's the best time and. Me missing it, uh, that hurts. It is late June, and a nurse's strike looms at Rhode Island Hospital. The family must decide if it is in John's best interest to leave the hospital for the Burke Rehabilitation Center in White Plains, New York. He is not quite ready to leave, but Mike and Paige are concerned about the quality of care during a strike. Everyone is gathered. Suddenly, it is moving day. Come on, you don't cry. Oh, oh, not cry. <laughs> Well, we want to see you laugh. Don't cry. You make us cry too. Happy, you know that. Don't cry. Be strong. John has gained weight and is stronger. 
But today, he is emotional about leaving the hospital and the people who have cared for him. As everyone celebrates in the hallway, he and Dan say a quiet goodbye. It was the divine intervention that pretty much brought us together. And uh, I think he's done a lot more for me than, I don't, than uh, I've ever done for him, you know. <laughs> Dr. Levy comes to see John for the last time. He is positive about John's recovery and his future. It's funny, I, I've said to Paige and Mike all along, and I've had this feeling that sometimes things happen for a reason. You never want to make anything good about a tragedy. But something about the family and then talking to John, I've really become convinced that I think he has a lot to offer. I think that this is going to bring out something in him that's going to be very important for a lot of people. Then, after 12 long weeks, it is time to go. We're doing it, big guy. Bye, John. I love you. Two ICU nurses are there. Joanne Chicatello and Leslie Cox say it is the first time in their careers they've come to say goodbye to a patient. It's incredible. The nurses and the doctors have worked so hard on John. And we did it for John to get him through it. We did it for Paige and Mike and little Mike. Their whole family is wonderful. But I think we did it for us. I mean, I think we just, we all got together and decided that it was not going to happen this time. And we really worked very hard. Um, I told him that I loved him, that I was proud of him, and that I was very sorry that we couldn't have saved more of him. Those are the things he'll have to live with forever, and I wish we could have saved so much more um, and made him as perfect as possible. I love you! How grateful I am that he's alive, how hard things are going to be, but how much I love these people. You guys ready? Yeah. Ready. Uh, Jeez. Pictures are taken, goodbyes are said. It is graduation day for everyone. Bye, honey. I love you. A long way from those first frightened weeks in the waiting room. We will feel better when John gets in an ambulance or whatever we're on and we're heading towards home to rehab where he can start to get his life back. You know, we can start to get our life back as a family. I mean, that's when, that will be a great moment for us. There is a long road ahead and the work begins. It is late September. John has been at Burke Rehabilitation for two months. His progress is now visible. He and his physical therapist, Jessica Heffernan, work for hours each day to strengthen his body. Seven. Eight. The meningococcemia left nine, his limbs with deep purple wounds. Scars from the blood clots that moved through him. Reminders of the gangrene that set in. He works to rebuild the muscle that remains. Today, he lifts 20-pound weights on his left leg. Last one. Last one. Good. Nice job. He started without being able to do it with any. He wasn't able to keep his knee straight. It would, uh, as he raised his leg, his knee would bend. He wasn't able to keep the muscle contracted for that amount of time to keep it straight all the way up. John's right side is stronger than his left. Although the right leg is partially amputated, it has more muscle and control. He will need that strength to walk with a prosthetic limb. Hold it there, hold it there, hold it there, hold it there, and let it down slowly. Nice job. It's as much of a workout for me as it is for him sometimes. It is the thought of walking that makes John push himself every day, and his competitive spirit has begun to reemerge. He is really strong. He's definitely stronger than I am. Sometimes we have some competitions on who can, uh, who can handle weights, and uh, it's definitely not me. <laughs> John has made remarkable progress since waking from the six-week coma. He is sitting up now and operating an electric wheelchair. But there have been serious setbacks. 
Just two weeks before, he endured emergency surgery on his left hand. Infection had set in and more of his thumb had to be removed. It was a devastating blow and sent him back to square one in his therapy. Occupational therapist Karen Raniklev must teach John to care for himself. He now has only his right thumb for gripping and control and must strengthen it as much as possible. It helps me to hold things and get used to, get used to holding things and then also it, the more I do this, the more stronger I get with my thumb, so the more pressure I'll be able to put on things and hold things when I have to. Despite the trouble with his left hand, John sees his own progress and his optimism is returning. In your eye. <laughs> he deals with this better than anybody I could even imagine. And I think the hardest parts for him, the things that seem like they're the hardest for him, is when he has a setback. When he had to go in for the surgery, I mean, it was, de it was devastating. It, you know, it's a, it's a hard thing to deal with. And that's probably the darkest that I've seen him. I, and, and dark, it isn't mad, it isn't mean, it's just frustrated. Well, with the comb, you grip, and then you have to pull back. So with the friction, it slips out of my hand. It is the little things, literally, that pose a problem. Until now, using a comb has been too difficult. But the brush is thicker and easier to grasp. As we watch, John brushes his hair for the first time. So up there? Oh, that's great. Oh, no. That's the one thing that my parents fought for was to try to save my, my hands. And what, what it was was um, when they did the surgery, they thought this one was the worst one, my right hand. They thought oh, they were going to have to amputate it above the wrist. And my dad's like, please, you know, save it, you know, do what you can. And uh, they did, and it turned out to be better than my left one, thank God, so. Tonight marks another first for John. He is going on a hospital field trip to the movies. You know, getting out, the first time I really leave work, not in the ambulance, so it's kind of good. In fact, it is the first time John has gone anywhere outside a hospital in almost seven months. John talks about people staring. You know, the little kids, you know, oh, hey, look, he's got one leg, you know, and it, it, it doesn't bother me. And uh, if people are going to stare, they're going to stare. And I'm not, you know, I can't do anything about it. Um, but I just hope, you know, they would get to know me before they pass judgment on me or anything like that. John's father has come to see him off. Mike and Paige spend each night with their son to ensure he always has help. Tonight is Mike's turn. He is as nervous about the trip as John. They asked me if I wanted to go, and I said, no, he's on his own. This is uh, so far to getting better. You got about 10-15 minutes. What time is it? What are you? It's 7-15. All right. What time does it start? I don't know. What movie are we watching? At the theater, John handles his own money and buys his own ticket. One for the watcher? It is a sweet taste of the real world again. I usually run home, change real quick, do his bag. At home the next morning, Paige prepares a bag of clothes to take to John. It is her night to stay. I think he's starting to wear more long pants. This is her daily ritual. It is a semblance of normalcy, finally, in her life. And I think the hardest part is that we, none of us are together anymore. I think that's what I find so hard. Even though everybody was always running in different directions and the kids had their sports, we were just always together. And I think the hardest part is I'm always alone. It's hard for me to go down to John's room. All his shoes, they're all lined up under his bed. I know all I want is for him to come home. I just want us all in the same room together. Now, if I start crying, why am I putting on mascara? Um, that, I think, is so hard. It's just, a, it's lonely, it's empty. You know, it's really empty without him.
either myself or my husband have been with John really basically throughout these last six months. And I feel he has to start to take small steps of independence. You know, little steps of weaning away. At the rehabilitation center, John is as candid as his mother about how life has changed. He talks about being an amputee and what his life will be like. I just feel, you know, talking to a lot of people that I'm better off, you know, that I'm lucky. You know, yeah, it happened to me, but to still be alive, um, still, you know, you know, they were scared that I might, you know, be have some brain damage. You know, you know, and uh, you know, with the extremities, I could have lost, you know, some of my facial features. You know, when you look at that, it's just like, you know, hey, it's not that bad. And to just look at it now and be like, you know, wow, um, it's, you know, it, it has to be a miracle. You know that I got to the hospital on time and that. Uh, the doctors did see what happened to me, not letting me go back to the dorm. That uh, I didn't go that night. If I went that night, then you know they could have maybe released me, and I would have never went back to the hospital, and I would have you know died in my bed. But um, you know everything. I think that 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 I went through was just a miracle. John is overwhelmed by the number of people who have helped him. He plans to repay them by using what he calls his second chance to help others. Later on, you know, if I visit hospitals or, you know, rehabilitation center and I help, you know, someone cope with something, then, you know, I'll know that, you know, even though this happened, it's all, it's all worth it to make someone else feel a little bit better. How you doing? What's up? Mm. There's my brother. Oh, there he is. Mikey the Mike. That afternoon, a visit from the entire family. With them is Dr. Chris Reardon, John's history teacher from Salve Regina. He has made weekly, sometimes daily trips to New York to help John continue his courses. All of the teachers, are, they wanted me to get his email address and everything okay. so that we can start decide just how we can uh, right. start you know, up a consistent okay. process. This is not just a matter of education. John is 19 and considered an adult. The catch's insurance company threatened to drop his medical coverage unless Mike and Paige could prove John is still a full-time student. So special tutoring began. The last juncture we had, we were talking about uh, the whole process of manifest destiny during the 19th century. There were a lot of people... We didn't think he was going to live, and that's pretty much what we said, if he lived anything else we can deal with and uh, we're dealing with this so far so in a way it hasn't been as bad as as we thought it was going to be but to me he was my big brother and you know I looked up to him whether he's sick or not I got it here I got you this one here everyone has gone home Paige and John go through the stacks of mail he still receives oh this is a big one I'm sorry, can I see? Hundreds of cards and pictures already cover his room like wallpaper. As Paige readies the extra bed for herself, John is careful to read every word of his card. It is a connection with home as he spends another night away from it. The next day, John waits in his room for his parents to arrive. He will get unexpected visitors instead. Like as soon as he gets out of here, like he can do a lot of things. Most of the Salve basketball team has driven from Newport to New York to surprise John. It will be a short but important visit. Apple. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are talking about What's up? Good. How are you? Good. Good. I'm not a magician here, you know, you're dying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, it's kind of close. We heard there was a public pool up here. We saw a diagonal swimming. He is surrounded by some of his closest friends, friends who stood by him through his darkest days. That's a bunch of guys that are, you know, great, great friends and great athletes. And um, watching them play, you know, it's going to be tough not knowing that I could be out there, but 
wherever I am. You know, I want them to know that they're going to have my support, you know, with everything they do. You know, I hope the best for all of them. They tell John they will soon be practicing again. It does not discourage him. Their stories and their energy are his inspiration. <laughs> In late October, John stands on his prosthetic leg for the first time. He has not been upright since his ambulance ride to Rhode Island Hospital in March. One week later, he is not only standing, but walking. So I'm not happy, I'd rather start running and jumping, but we'll get there. His progress impresses even the therapist. He has already graduated from the walker. Too slow. And doesn't know the word slow. It's my normal steps. And apparently. <laughs> You're tall. <laughs> In fact, John is taller. He is adjusting to a new leg and a new height. Amazingly, he has grown two inches during his illness. He now stands six feet six inches. You know, when I walk, I kind of have to look down to, to see where my feet go so I don't cross over my feet or trip over something or drag my foot or do something like that so I walk and the last couple of days I've been kind of trying to get my head off looking straight ahead. John is looking ahead with a special plan in mind. His teammates have begun practice at their new gym and they will play their home opener in mid-November. They tell John they will miss him. He is determined not to let that happen. Open on the way and look in. John decides it is his turn to surprise the team. He wants to return to Salve for the game. It is November 21st. Sit down, where's the case? Oh, there. John has arrived at the gym for the home opener. He is back at Salve for the first time. It has been nine months since that fateful Friday night. There to greet him are family members, friends, doctors, and nurses. They took part in his survival and recovery. They have come to witness his return. Oh, God. <laughs> come on, guys, right from the get. Coach Plansky has kept John's homecoming a secret from the team. How you doing? Okay. I'm good. John waits in the hallway to be announced on the court. He has come full circle on this journey. To overcome adversity, you know, everybody's going to have it. In their, uh, in their life sometime, if it's small or big. And when it comes, you just got to deal with it and, and go on and not be down on yourself and over the hump. Nothing makes me more excited than being able to announce number 25, John Cash. With each step, John moves toward a new chapter in his life. He faces it on his own two feet. One he was born with, the other he has earned.
Thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you for looking out for me when my mom left. You're welcome, baby. Thank you. <laughs> Happy day. <laughs> Good luck to you. All right. You worked very, very hard. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed NECN's special presentation of Coming Home, the John Catch Story. If you'd like to help the Catch family, you can make a donation to Carmel for Catch, P.O. Box 414, Patterson, New York, 12563. There are advances every day in the science of artificial limbs. The money will go into a supplemental needs trust fund to help John pay for the latest prosthetic technology. Thank you for joining us for this NECN presentation. Hello, I'm Charlie Kraft, Station Manager and News Director at NECN.